This video contains content that viewers may find disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome back to 100 Horrible Ways People Can Die. I'm John. And I'm Alex. And today's episode is about poisoning. I feel like I've been poisoned. I'm super out of it today. Yeah, same here. It must be something in the air, the water, something we ate. Who knows how you can get poisons, but there's so many ways to get them. I stayed up so late last night and got up so early that I feel like maybe I have some type of, uh, I don't know, slow your body and go to sleep poison. You call that alcohol. No alcohol was involved in my oh. outing yesterday. Maybe. I don't know why I stayed up so late, to be honest. It happens to the best of us. And since we're not very good, it happens to us much more than often. So, on my poisoning story today mm -hmm. is going to be about Georgi Markov. Okay. Is that how you say his name? Um, I think. Maybe. I don't know. Anyway, he died in 1978 of uh, Ryzen poisoning. It's uh -huh. kind of like a James Bond type of... It literally uh, is a James Bond story. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, anyway, that's what we're going to talk about. So, with this type of poisoning, you kind of get flu symptoms, and then you just end up dying. Oh, that sounds very crappy. Yeah. For lack of a better word. Yeah. I don't know a lot about poisons. I know that if you get bit by, like, certain uh, snakes, you get poison, and your arm can, like, blow up and swell wow. and split and things like that, and you end up dying. Yeah. Heart attacks or whatever. I think poisoning might actually be the broadest topic we've picked so far, because there's so many different ways that you can get poisoned. Whether it's a compound, an element, a gas, a solid, a liquid, all these different, and they all have different symptoms, well, they all have different biological effects. Think, I'm, think about this, two, over 2 million people a year get poisoned. Around the world? No, in the United States, uh -huh. alone. Not to death. Just Not poisoned. to death, they, but yeah. they get poisoned. Yeah. That's right. Well, I would even put drugs and alcohol in that category because they biologically are i suppose kind of like yeah yeah you're right alcohol literally is a central nervous toxin true central nervous toxin. it is it slows, your, slows your breathing and that's how it can kill you yeah same with a lot of drugs i mean not all drugs but some drugs are definitely poisons an opioid probably i would call that a poison even if it's not defined as one it's a super common thing to happen yeah. is to get poison and that's only the yes. reported cases and it right. looks like uh 87 according to national safety council uh, over eighty-seven thousand people died in 2020 of poisoning so people do get poisoned and they and they do die so yeah if you get poisoned you should call for help um there's a uh poison hotline you can call which mm -hmm. uh will flash on the screen here and then yeah. you can always call 911 if you you don't have that number yeah and there's so many different ways you can get poisoned some natural some chemical you know. i was reading uh children are probably very likely to get poisoned because they don't really know well that's right that's, yeah, that's probably that's common serious because yeah they don't have the same defenses i guess their livers probably can't process those toxins as fast so they probably have more susceptible to it right when i was kind of researching this i found a couple of articles where people were poisoned by antifreeze by their like wives oh okay. and they put in their iced tea and they didn't even know they were drinking antifreeze and then eventually they uh they died of antifreeze uh being poisoned by antifreeze and well, i guess um, is it because of the, ethan the methanol in the antifreeze? I, I don't really know. I know that some, you know, your kidneys and stuff shut down and stuff and you just die. And then yeah. the one case, uh, they didn't even realize that the guy had died of like poisoning. They thought he just died of natural, natural causes because it was so s slow and it shut down organs. And uh, they actually had to like exhume the body and do an autopsy later because people started to suspect that that had happened or something so I think it's poisoning is definitely one of the more common ways people died in history just because all through history alexander the great they say was poisoned by his generals people, right um uh, i heard from my dentist of all people recently that they think that george washington may have been poisoned from his ventures wow yeah he might have had blood poisoning from that oh That's a prevailing theory now well, lead, lead never leaves the body, so... A lot of people had blood poisoning. You know, mm -hmm. We can talk about how the term Mad Hatter actually has a poisoning background. You know, well, the, if you want to talk about lead poisoning, pretty much the entire population, anybody born 1970 to, I think, 1989? No, longer than that. No, no, no. I'm, I'm talking about the specific incident. So... Mm -hmm. They uh, they put lead in gasoline. Yes, in the 30s. In the third, okay, so yeah, from the, from the 30s on, an entire generation mm -hmm. of human beings were lead poisoned, yeah. and it literally they say I don't know if this is true or not, but it's it, I read that our IQs are like 10 points yeah, lower as well than they they should be because of lead poisoning, and it takes a couple of generations for it to completely go away. So right. you know, 
we are probably now, the generation coming now, is probably the, the first to be over that. Sort of. So what you're talking about, I think, is lead tetraethylene, something like uh, that. Something and like it's that. an additive that they would put in the gasoline <clears> so <throat> the engine wouldn't knock as much. Right, exactly. And, and the guy who came up with that. Yes, the guy who, was it Fritz Haber who came up with it? I don't remember his name, but the guy who came up with it, like, totally said that, oh, lead's harmless, it's harmless, it's fine. Right. And, he ended up dying oh, of lead poisoning. No, it's not him. It, so the person who invented that is the same person <clears throat> who invented CFCs, which destroyed the ozone layer. The same I guy, yes. He put the yes, he um, put it in the hairspray and they yes. destroyed it. So he almost destroyed the world twice. Yeah, inventing things. Yes, yeah. and I mean that's also not the extent of lead. I mean, there's so much more we could do a whole episode. Probably should do a whole episode on just lead poisoning. Definitely could. So, anyway, I guess let's get into our get story. Into our story. Nestled within the silent crevices of Bulgaria, swaddled by the antiquity of the Balkans, a spark was ignited in 1929. A child was born to a humble family, a child who was to become a peculiar sort of luminary. Georgi Markov, an unassuming name for an individual destined to attract national acclaim and international notoriety. Markov was born into a world still recovering from the upheavals of the Great War. The craggy landscapes of Bulgaria mirrored the struggles of its people, veiling a restless yearning for freedom beneath the harsh communist blanket. It was in this paradoxical womb that the fledgling storyteller began his journey. His childhood was an orchestra of words, an effervescent blend of old folk tales whispered by his grandmother and the blooming narratives that sprouted in his young, fertile mind. Even as a boy, Markov was a weaver of worlds, his stories creating ripples in the placid waters of his small-town life. As he grew, so did his reputation. He seemed to have an uncanny ability to spin yarns that moved people, tales that transcended the boundaries of the mundane and echoed in the hearts of those who heard them. His plays, novels, and narratives reflected the complex tapestry of life, earning him an indelible place in the Bulgarian literary landscape. Yet in the marrow of this growing luminary, something gnawed at him, an unfulfilled hunger that nibbled at his contentment. Unbeknownst to him, he was slowly gravitating towards a path that would lead him to an extraordinary destiny. Even as his star ascended, shadows began to gather at the periphery of his life. His words, while loved by the masses, had begun to ripple the still waters of the authorities. The communist regime, a sleeping dragon, was being stirred awake by Markov's mounting popularity and the quiet insurrection seated in his works. His life, both ordinary and extraordinary, was on the precipice of an abyss that would consume his tranquility, replacing it with a relentless darkness that lurked just beyond the horizon. And so, the stage was set for a dance of power and principle, a deadly ballet where freedom of thought clashed against the iron fist of oppression. This, then, was the early life of Georgi Markov, a beacon of creativity, a figure of admiration, yet a man standing in the gathering gloom of the storm to come. Georgi Markov, now a household name, was standing on the precipice of a dark abyss. His fame swelled, cascading through the mountains and valleys of Bulgaria, reflecting in the earnest eyes of his compatriots. Yet, the taste of success was tarnished by a bitter undertone, the gnawing discontent with the iron hand that held his homeland. Bulgaria, the land he adored, was smothered under a thick blanket of brutal censorship, unchecked corruption and a pernicious oppression of freedom that threatened to snuff out the spirit of its people. It was a dystopian nightmare swathed in the drapery of a utopian dream, and Markov, with his keen writer's intuition, saw through the charade. The more he observed, the more his heart ached. His soul stirred, the echoes of a silenced nation resonating within him, fanning the sparks of dissent into a fervent flame. Each brutal decree, each voice silenced, and each freedom stripped away, fed the fire. The patriot within him was roused, shaking off the shackles of fear, primed to fight a battle of words and ideals. His weapon was his pen, his ammunition the truth, and his shield the love for his homeland. Through his works he protested the oppressive regime, weaving tales of poignant reality shrouded in the veil of fiction. His characters, vivacious and compelling, voiced the unspoken angst of a suppressed populace, discreetly criticizing the very authorities who thought they controlled him. Yet, 
His subtle rebellion was not as unnoticed as he presumed. He had pricked the bear with a stick, unaware of the consequences. His words, while wrapped in the protective sheath of metaphor and allegory, had pierced the veneer of the regime's apparent benevolence, stirring a monster that lurked beneath. The eyes of the government turned towards him, their gaze steely and cold, their intentions far from benign. Unseen in the shadows, they observed the rising star, scrutinized his words, and the veiled defiance they carried. The ire of the authorities was stoked. A dangerous game was set into motion, its players unaware, its stakes far higher than ever imagined. Here was Georgi Markov, the beloved writer turned silent dissenter, unknowingly caught in the crosshairs of a deadly enemy. His path had veered from the well-trodden trail of fame to the obscure lanes of defiance, heading towards a future veiled in uncertainty and danger. The unyielding tension within the borders of Bulgaria in 1969 was like a vice on the skull of Georgi Markov. Each day, each hour, an intensifying squeeze, the snaking dread a constant companion in his vein-riddled temples. Fear was a harsh taskmaster, and it had tightened its reins around him, forcing the once celebrated author towards a fateful, daring decision. He was in Italy when the realization struck him, surrounded by cobblestone streets resonating with an age-old charm under skies freer than he had ever known, an insidious seed of escape planted itself in his mind. It grew rapidly, entwining his thoughts, offering both tantalizing freedom and chilling uncertainty. His homeland, Bulgaria, was a place of love and horror, the canvas on which he had painted the tapestry of his life. Yet, he was being compelled to leave it all behind, the cobbled streets echoing with his childhood laughter, the corners whispering tales of his youth, a country once filled with the promise of dreams now echoed with a haunting nightmare. His heart ached with the gravity of his decision, but the call of liberty was irresistible, a sweet siren song in the cacophony of repression. With a heart heavy with apprehension and determination, he made his move. In the dark cloak of night, he vanished from the Italian hotel he was staying at, his flight as swift as it was silent. He slipped into the shadows, a man escaping from the grip of an unseen beast traversing a path that had fear as its milestone and freedom as its destination. The West greeted him with a bittersweet welcome. His arrival in London marked the end of his harrowing journey, yet it was just the beginning of a new life. The sprawling city was a stark contrast to his homeland, its diversity a reminder of the freedom he now had. The British Broadcasting Corporation, the BBC, became his sanctuary, a beacon in a foreign land. Here he found a platform to continue his work, the hushed cries of his Bulgarian brothers and sisters finding voice through his poignant words. Thus, the celebrated writer transformed into a defiant dissident, his old life a mere memory, a whisper from the past. The journey had been fraught with fear, but Markov had finally escaped to freedom. The shadow of the regime loomed large in his rearview mirror, a monstrous reminder of what he had left behind, even as he ventured into an unknown future. Markov was not a man to waste his newfound freedom. Nestled within the heart of London, amid the bustling life of the British Broadcasting Corporation, he found his voice echoing with renewed vigor. The BBC's Bulgarian service and Radio Free Europe became his stages, the airwaves his unbound companions, carrying the cries of his silenced countrymen far and wide. His broadcasts weren't mere anecdotes or casual observations. Each word was a carefully etched portrait of the realities of communist Bulgaria. Each phrase a piercing critique aimed at the heart of the regime. His stories were not the sugar-coated fantasies that the regime peddled to the world, but raw, unvarnished tales of oppression, of silenced voices and stifled dreams. His series, In Absentia Reports, became a lighthouse in the tumultuous sea of propaganda. Each broadcast shone with the harsh light of truth, illuminating the darkness that Bulgaria had been plunged into. His voice, clear and unwavering, exposed the iron fist of the regime, revealing the scars it had etched on the face of his beloved homeland. The impact was immediate and far-reaching. His words echoed in living rooms and cafes, spreading like a wildfire in the dry underbrush of misinformation. People listened, their hearts stirred by the haunting realities he unveiled. Markov was not just a voice, he was a lifeline, a link to the truths that had been swept under the communist rug. However, the reaction was not only one of revelation and awakening. His broadcasts stirred a hornet's nest, 
sending ripples of disturbance through the corridors of the Bulgarian regime and its allies. Agitation bloomed into fury as the regime found its carefully constructed facade cracking under the relentless assault of Markov's words. Markov, the writer turned dissident, was no longer a mere nuisance. He had transformed into a significant threat, a thorn in the side of the regime that refused to be plucked out. The man they had failed to silence in their own country was now shouting their grim secrets from rooftops they could not control, and the reverberations were impossible to ignore. The game of shadows and whispers had taken a dangerous turn. Markov had chosen his path, his every word striking a blow against the stone wall of the regime. But the regime wasn't about to let him continue unchecked. As Markov's voice spread, the shadow of the regime grew more ominous, a predator lurking in the darkness, ready to strike back. As September 1978 threw its murky blanket over London, Georgi Markov, the 49-year-old Bulgarian dissident, found himself lingering on a bridge, lost in his thoughts. The bridge was steeped in the sepia tones of a typical London afternoon, the iconic landscape dotted with commuters, and the air echoing with the city's usual humdrum. Unbeknownst to him, in this innocent tableau, danger lurked, cloaked in the dreary ordinary. Markov was oblivious to the prying eyes scrutinizing him from a distance. As he awaited his bus, his thoughts on the BBC broadcast he had planned for the day, he was entirely unaware of the chilling countdown that had begun. A macabre clock, ticking down the four days he had left to live, had been set in motion. In the throng of London's denizens, a seemingly inconspicuous figure held an object that was as ordinary as it was lethal. An umbrella. To any onlooker, it was just an umbrella, a mundane shield against London's frequent showers. However, this was an instrument of death masquerading as a token of British weather preparedness. The sudden sharp sting on the back of Markov's thigh pulled him out of his reverie. He spun around, surprise etched on his face, only to see a figure retrieving an umbrella from the ground. The figure murmured an apology, the syllables rolling off his tongue with a distinct foreign accent. There was a certain haste in his movements, an urgency that belied the simplicity of the situation. Before Markov could shake off his surprise, the stranger had already crossed the expanse of Waterloo Bridge. Like a wisp of smoke, he vanished into the anonymity of a waiting taxi and disappeared, leaving behind an air of discomfort and a dying Bulgarian dissident. As the man disappeared, Markov could not shake off a sudden chilling sense of dread. But the city moved on, oblivious to the deadly ballet that had just taken place. The bridge bore silent witness to the transaction, a grim secret etched into its very stones. In the grand narrative of his life, this chapter had begun. A chapter where his name was etched, not with ink, but with the lethal poison of a ricin pellet, delivered by the innocuous sting of an umbrella. The days that followed carried a weight of foreboding, a heavy shroud that draped around the form of Georgi Markov. His body, once a resilient fortress, started succumbing to an invisible assault. His once vibrant eyes were clouded with pain, his robust form racked with a fever that refused to abate. Every breath was a battle, each heartbeat a defiant protest against the insidious poison that had invaded his body. His vibrant spirit was held hostage in a body that was gradually failing him. A cruel enemy was laying siege from within, an enemy unseen but felt with every pulse, every labored breath. London's best physicians gathered around his bedside, their brows furrowed with concern, their minds a whirlwind of questions. Despite their tireless efforts, their advanced equipment, their collective wisdom. They found themselves in a battle they seemed destined to lose. The enemy was elusive, the damage extensive, and relentless. Markov was slipping away, his life symphony reaching its final, tragic crescendo. The stranger with the umbrella had evaporated into thin air, his existence as ephemeral as the London fog. All that remained was the chilling aftermath of his actions, a deadly residue that clung to Markov's life. His trail was lost in the labyrinthine city, leaving behind a cryptic puzzle that perplexed even the most brilliant minds. The specter of the Cold War had shown its merciless face, its consequences no longer confined to shadowy boardrooms and political chess games. In the shroud of his death, Georgi Markov became a symbol of a battle far larger than himself. His life, a testament to the indomitable spirit of a man who dared to speak against oppression, ended not with a whimper but with a defiant roar echoing in the silent corridors of the BBC. 
and the collective consciousness of a world waking up to the ruthless reality of the Cold War. Markov was no more, but his voice lived on, reverberating through the annals of history, a poignant reminder of a man who dared to reveal the truth. As the decades rolled on, the world changed in countless ways. Empires crumbled, walls fell, and new eras were born. Yet, some remnants of the past remained stubbornly immune to the passage of time. One such enduring mystery was the assassination of Georgi Markov. The echoes of that fateful September day in 1978 continued to resonate, the memory of Markov's tragic end etched indelibly into the annals of history. His assassination stood as one of the Cold War's most chilling chapters, a stark reminder of the ruthlessness that simmered beneath the veneer of diplomacy and political maneuvering. The Umbrella Murderer, as he came to be known, faded into the mists of time, leaving behind a void that no intensive investigation could fill. The elusive stranger on Waterloo Bridge, despite the relentless pursuit of countless detectives and years of poring over cold case files, remained a phantom. His identity, like the final piece of a jigsaw puzzle, continued to elude capture, contributing to the aura of intrigue that shrouded Markov's final moments. The mystery of Georgi Markov's end remains, a cryptic chapter in the sprawling saga of human history. Well, that guy uh, yeah. suffered pretty bad, huh? Yeah. His whole life was seemed like he was, I don't know, pretty well, terrible. I'm happy I'm not a spy. Or born into a communist country, I guess. Well, sort of. I mean, anyway. <laughs> sort of. Well, my parents were. <laughs> yeah, and they escaped, thank goodness. Yeah. So, what should we do next? Let's talk about some other types of poisoning? Sure. I feel like... It's such a vast topic. We need to talk a little bit more about what we can do. And let's get some feedback from the audience and see what you want to hear about in a future episode. What do you think is the, I don't want to say sexiest, but the sexiest way of being killed by poison? Or whatever you'd like to send us is fine. Yeah. Or whatever you'd like to send us. Yeah. Um, I personally like how we were talking about light. I think light is fascinating. I like the stories behind some of the other elements too. Mercury, for example. There's a ton of interesting stories about mercury poisoning over the years. And there's a lot of history with it too. There's a lot of history with, for example, with plutonium. I'm reading a book now just about the history of plutonium. And how it was used for being for poisoning people or Yes. Radioactive elements. Was general. there something recent that happened where somebody was given like a yes. radio radioactive pellet or but something that was at not a restaurant? Plutonium, that was polonium. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So Kind of similar to our story that we just heard, um, a Russian dissident, I don't remember, Alexander Lipchenko, something like that, Lipchenko, something like that, walking down the street, and also I think it was an umbrella, stabs the guy in the leg, and inside is a pellet of polonium. Now, polonium is pretty rare. There's only a few ways to get it, and usually you have to go through a hospital or a nuclear facility to get Probably it. Probably pretty easy to trace back to its, it's origin. It's pretty easy to, tra to trace back to where it came from, that it was somewhere not legitimate, because every... Supposedly, every Western hospital or facility that has polonium, because it is so toxic and so dangerous, keeps a very tight inventory on it. Gotcha. But just a couple of grams should be enough to kill a person. But if you know where it came from, then you're pretty much just admitting who you are that, or who well, ordered the, the assassination, I suppose. Sort of. I mean, you know it's something to do with somebody who wanted this person dead, but then again, if somebody shoots somebody, you kind of have motive too, so... I guess, but if you get randomly shot in the street or you're poisoned with a piece of uh, radioactive pellet, yeah, you can the trace the pellet back to where it came from. But you when know? you're a spy getting shot in the street, Sounds it's like Ryzen was better. Ryzen is definitely better. There's, so you can get that. What does that come from? Almonds or something? Uh, Ryzen, I believe, the castor bean? Is that where it comes from? I don't know. I, I, I think I saw on Breaking Bad he was using like yes. almonds or something. No, I think it's the castor bean. Castor bean? So you know... You know Castor oil, castor oil, the, the, the yeah, castor, castor oil, oil yeah. is made from the castor bean. Okay. That's how you get rice, and you can't eat the castor bean. It's extremely toxic. Well, it, I wouldn't it, eat castor oil either. <laughs> well, it can't kill you. People used to take a spoonful of castor oil every day. Really? Yeah. Well, maybe I'm wrong, though. You used to feed it to your kid as punishment, keep them normal or regular or something. Oh, sure, if you want to kill your child, that's that's probably a good way to Castor oil? Them. There was no death. It was, was castor bean oil? I don't know. There's, I don't know. It was castor oil, there. yeah. That was actually the first oil that was used as an engine oil. I think I remember 
Natural. Before Wasn't it Tom it. Sawyer and Tom Sawyer, his grandma or aunt or whatever, would punish him with a spoonful of castor oil? I don't remember that. I don't remember either. Well, something something like that. Up, yeah, yeah. I don't remember things very well. <laughs> make up stuff too, so don't trust me. What else we got? Nothing? Oh, I got a lot of stuff. Alright, if you want to keep going. So, the most deadly industrial accident of all time. Poisoning accident? Poisoning accident. The Bhopal disaster in India. Okay. In Bhopal. Makes sense. So, in this case, it was a facility that housed dioxins, and dioxins are some of the most toxic chemicals to humans. I don't remember exactly how they kill people, but it's not a it's not a good process, and they're I believe they're airborne, they're heavier than air, and so what happened here was they were using this as a precursor for some chemical process. The holding tank exploded, and it created this toxic gas cloud that killed well over twenty thousand people in India. And so when that it, when the vat it was so. like a vat that exploded or something. Yes. So did I was, it blow up any other vats like our beer extravaganza? No, so what I was reading about this was a turning point in some industrial processes where one of the safety rules as a result of this is if you have a toxic precursor such as this dioxin was, you have to minimize the amount that you store on site. So they they had this massive tank that they would store it in, so that way they would have less supply interruptions. But you said it pressurized or something. There was no pressure release or it anything? It must have been pressurized and maybe that's how, I don't remember the exact details. I didn't research it enough specifically for this example. And I don't want to put false information out there because yeah. I'm hungover and don't remember. <laughs> so I don't really know, but that's something to look into. There's actually, from what I remember, not a real good death count because the number, it, the they're near the factory there was a slum. So a lot of people living there and may have died as well and weren't reported exactly so people estimate that over 20,000 people have died as a result of that it could have been even more and dioxins are a horrible way to die sounds that way yeah they're one of the most toxic compounds to humans so you have your radiation which most people probably won't be exposed to radiation much in their lifetime unless they're doing something really really unsafe working in a specific facility or if there's a nuclear war or something. Yeah, I didn't really look up the most common poisoning Oh, oh, it has to be, be drugs honest. by far. Well, Opioids, for example, kill over 100,000 people a year in the I, US. I didn't really look into the 87,000 people who died in 2020 if it was right. drugs or if it was actual, some type of something that's actually classified as poison. So, not a narcotic, but an actual right. poison. So, I'm going to guess that it would Narcotics be poison. Are a part of that, I'm I don't know if, I don't know if, if they would do that. Would they so do that? The data that I had did have it breaking down into narcotics versus other types of poisons and I I seem to remember I could be wrong it was about 5,000 deaths a year in the US on average in the last few years from poisons that are not narcotic based there's also a section in the codes where there's poison undetermined type because there's not really a way to know what poison it was for example yeah so that that adds some extra but the number of deaths from opioids specifically and other narcotics in general are way higher than from accidental poisonings but i would be i would be curious into researching more into what the leading poisons are and do we consider carbon monoxide for example a poison i don't think so i don't know i don't think we have an answer for that one but if we did that i don't i'm not cause of death. i'm trying to find it here uh, here's the most for common, it says, uh, opioid overdoses are yeah. the most common form of poisoning. So, yeah, by followed by sedatives, sleeping medications, and household cleaning supplies. Antidepressants are another common exposure among adults. So, probably 90% of your, again, just throwing a number out there, are probably related, if not more than, are probably related to narcotics or medications. I mean, what's a common way for people to try to commit suicide is sleeping pills and alcohol i would consider those poisons too yeah i was more interested in just actual poisons not really something considered a you, narcotic a rice in yeah like actual poisons not narcotics like nerve gas or something yeah like yeah that, mustard gas yeah exactly phosphine or whatever those are not very common it looks like they lump drug poisoning or drug overdoses in with poisoning yeah with every single stat here that i'm looking at so right. And I, Unfortunately, I can't get an actual. They're even putting alcohol into right. 
uh, the poisoning category, which I understand why they do that because I mean you are poisoning Maybe it's yourself. Maybe a good chat GPT question. Yeah, I don't think so. Okay, guess not. Chat GPT, GPT will just Same throw out thing. yeah, yeah. throw out the same stuff. That's true. I mean, it says there's four types of poisoning: Swall okay. swallowed, inhaled, absorbed, or injected. Okay. So, that, that's drugs. Yeah, thing. every drug. I mean, all the drugs are in there. So, I mean, when we talk about poisonings, there's things that will poison you over time, and maybe cause cancer or other issues, degenerative brain failure, or something like that, but aren't actually killing you, right? So, slowly, I the guess. Story of the Mad Hatter, right? The term Mad Hatter comes from hat workers who would work with felt and they would dip their brushes into liquid mercury wipe it on their mouths and then they would get degenerative brain loss from that so when you were mad as a hatter it's because you were poisoning yourself with mercury oh that's an interesting it. story so they were just poisoned yeah so they went the kind of way, went crazy there's a big story about how the ladies with watches they would put radium on them or something oh. to glow in the dark and they would lick the brush uh, and lots of them died from cancer in the mouth. And that's broke. horrible. Yeah. Well, I'm glad we know better now. Well, let us know what you'd like to hear more about, and we can do that in a future episode. Don't lick any brushes. Don't lick anything. anything. Not <laughs> and, even stamps. Yeah. that was on Seinfeld, too. Yeah. And the lady died from poison. All right. So, so I guess that's probably all we got probably for today. Probably all the time we got for today. All right. So what's the line? Stay safe out there. Stay safe out there.